Coming up, a renowned rock front man gives us the skinny on his band's first number one hit. Uh, the song actually came years before it was released. It was when he was visiting his parents, and his kid brother, who was only about 15 at the time, was messing around with a riff. And the singer loved it. He finished the song on the spot. Five years later, it would be the biggest rock song of that year. Uh, the brothers would later elaborate, calling the chorus a, a prayer, a rock and roll prayer. And a few years later, one of the greatest legends of the last 50 years would record a, a very strange but cool version. The interview is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love the music of the rock and roll era, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you're going to dig this channel where we get the stories of the song directly from the artists who created them. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Hit that big red button. Click the bell so you can be part of our daily honor roll of this time. And uh, click on our Patreon as well. Check out our new merch below. All this helps us keep the music alive. In the early 90s, bands like Soundgarden and Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, uh, these bands came in like a tsunami and wiped everything away. Although these bands were, were definitely influenced by heavy metal and classic rock. I mean, Nirvana definitely owes a debt to Boston's more than a feeling. Pearl Jam 10, I've said it before, it has much more in common with classic rock than any other genre that was an influence on the members individually. It was a fresh sound, but by the mid 90s, uh, things were starting to change. And really a second wave of bands came in to keep the flame of rock alive. You know, this is when hip hop and teen pop were taking over the radio airwaves. One of these bands that made an immediate impact was Collective Soul. Their first two albums sold three million copies each, uh, not to mention their first four albums were all platinum. They had seven number one hits on the rock charts and another two that went to, to number two. Uh, we covered them a few months back. You know, they had songs that defined those times, like December and The World I Know, which we covered, uh, Run Heavy. But their first big hit was Shine. Shine is a bona fide slice of 90s rock that went to number 11 on the Billboard Hot 100. And it crossed over to hit number four on the alternative charts. And it went to number one on the mainstream rock charts. And it charted worldwide. It was the biggest rock song in 1994. And it all came from a chance writing session between Ed Roland and his kid brother Dean. Ed decided to visit his parents, and at this time, a struggling musician, he heard his kid brother Dean chipping away at a cool riff. Uh, Dean was only about 15 then, and he was likely unaware of how great that riff was. It was one of those riffs that sound so classic that you feel like it was taken from another great song from the 60s or the 70s. But it was all collective soul. From there, the, the two finished the song, and it did take five years before it went to number one. The lead singer and songwriter Ed Rowland I've said it before, he's one of the nicest guys in music. Been able to interview him a couple of times over the years. He's just a genuine guy, cares deeply about rock and roll and music, uh, not only in the music he creates, but all the history that came before. He's one of the good guys for sure. And what's going to follow here is the story behind creating Shine and Collective Soul's debut album, Hints, Allegations, and Things Left Unsaid. So as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Uh, I'm wearing a black pair today, kind of my Buddy Holly look here. If you're in the market for new glasses or even sunglasses, Zenny is the place to go. You can design your own pair from scores of different frames, shapes, colors, and styles. And, you know, you can add great features like blue blocks to protect your eyes from digital blue light that we look at on our screens every day. You got to check it out today and download the new Zenny app. Here's Ed Rowland with the story of Shine. 
Let's go back to hints and allegations and things left unsaid, which you borrowed a little bit from Paul Simon there. I did. Which is great. That's okay. And the album cover, I remember seeing it. I was I was a senior in high school when mm -hmm. I first heard Shine. And uh, I remember seeing the album cover with... Uh, Mad Hatter, yeah. for lack of a better term. Exactly. The it guy was, from that Broadway musical, wasn't it? I don't know what it was. It was a book that I found that was... Uh, the demon Barbara. copyright free artwork. So oh, okay. I went in, I literally went in and I colored it. That's, you know, that's how in the basement we were, you know. Oh, I'll just color this. Boom. There's our album artwork. I'm like, well, I mean, you were way before, ahead of your time here because that's what everybody's doing now is they're creating their record in their basement. You guys were doing it back <laughs> in the early 90s. But not, not wanting to. We, we yeah. really wanted to go be in nine studios, but we still, to this day, like, I think two records we've been in major studios for like a, you know, a term. I've, I'm a, I own a lot of gear, and we've recorded everywhere from our rehearsal space to the last three records have been recorded in my home. It's, to me, it's about clarity to, 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 to put it down nowadays to, to disc, hard drive. But uh, any space is a good recording space as long as you go with the right attitude. I was just like droning over the A or the D and coming up with riffs underneath the, that open, open note on the guitar. And um, I had a lot of them, but uh, like I said before, my brother, I didn't know he played guitar. He was playing guitar, came in to see mom and dad one time, and Dean's 10 years younger than I am. So this was like, uh, I was 27 or 28 at the time. And uh, I was like showing him this and he was playing along and I'd never had a chorus to it, so I kind of wrote the chorus right there. I kind of finished the song right there in front of him, kind of show off to my younger brother, to be honest <laughs> with I always wondered where the yeah came from. Yeah. Was that something that happened right when you were putting together, or did it happen when, as you started to play it live and it just came in the moment? No, it happened when I put it together. I, uh, there, it's just a space, and I remember my original manager was hated the yeah he was like take that out and you get da 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 like i was like there needs to be something there so i went to the bathroom and got the uh toilet paper dispenser and just went yeah through that into a microphone i love it and to me it just kept it it kept it moving as a in my head as a producer or whatever you want to call it just it just kept the song moving well, now, of course, when you play it live, crowd gets to chant that part. I've never said yeah the whole time <laughs> I've ever played it. <laughs> I love it. When I wrote it, and you got to remember, I was 27 years old. I was just trying to get any anywhere in any place I could in the music industry, mostly as a songwriter, because at 27, 28, you're kind of long in the tooth to be a rock star. And I'm not saying I am now. I'm just saying to have a start up a band, most kids are early 20s. I just remember just writing and, and it, it was the first time I started writing how I felt. And I didn't even realize what I was writing. But it truly was a message to me. And I remember my dad coming to me. He, go, he goes, you wrote a prayer. And I said, no, I believe in the separation of church and rock and roll or religion and rock and roll. Like, I, didn't, I just wrote. And now I look back on it, I, I truly was writing for guidance from a higher power, where whatever that may be, who knows? No, sure. None of us know, but I truly believe at that moment, I was just searching, as I still am. I wasn't trying to write the song, it just kind of happened. Nowadays I sit down and go, I'm gonna write a song or something happens. But that one was just kind of stuck, stuck around for a couple of years. And I remember early Thank on, God. I remember early on somebody was asking you, or are you guys a Christian band because you use the word heaven? You're like, you ever heard of Led Zeppelin? They use the word heaven. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know and, I, and I get that. You know, <laughs> yeah. growing up in a, my dad being a minister, you know, 18 years of my life were in the church. So yeah. a lot of the language that I use, the jargon, whatever, is based, uh, is, is based, is scripture. But being in a band, unless all five guys, you know, sit around and say, this is what we're about, you can't say you're one thing or the other. Like, right. What I believe in, Dean may not believe, or Will name may not. So right. I was very careful that the band, though I can write and have those overtones, I cannot say that that's how we all think or how we all believe. 
Right. Um, that's unfair to those guys. So, uh, and I and I believe in separation of church and rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, I mean, what a great cover, and an honor to have Dolly Parton cover it. To win a Grammy. I know. With the song. What did you think when you heard that? Once again, I go back to my father. I was actually in uh, Arizona at the time. So there's a three hour difference at that point. My dad called me. I was at dinner with a bunch of baseball players that I, I'm a big sports nut. And uh, he goes, I, I just watched David Letterman, Dolly Parton just sing Shine. And I remember going, first off, what are you doing at this late and why are you watching David Letterman? <laughs> <laughs> and so I excused myself from dinner because of the time difference. I went home and I watched it. I was like, oh my God, that's unbelievable. And she was just genuinely one of the most sincere, sweet people. And to have someone that has written some of the greatest songs on the planet, to even just think about covering your song, much less covering it, was the ultimate award. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, she, she's, she's it. Let your light shine down. It's one of those songs from the 90s that is a classic rock staple. When I was growing up, and we speak of dad, my dad just passed away a couple weeks ago. He was a big collective oh, man, soul so fan. Oh, so sorry. Oh, thank you. But he was a big collective soul fan. He didn't like a lot of modern music. He raised me on the 60s and 70s. But That's a good man. Yeah. I like that. I remember in the 90s growing up listening to 70s, those rock staples. And now that's what it is with Shine. It's a classic rock staple for the ages. Thank you, you know. for that. And, and God bless your father and sorry about that. Oh, thank um, you so much. I think when Shine came out, it kind of got looped in the whole grunge and post grunge. You know, I grew up listening to, I mean, the first concert I ever went to see was my dad took me to see Johnny Cash. Fell into a burning ring of fire. I went down, down. You know, I started wow. Johnny Cash, Liberace, Elton John, The Kings. So I was wide variety. I, I, we, first off, to me, grunge was very geographically located. It was the Northwest. Sure. We were South, and I grew up on FM radio. I have no problem saying that. I mean, I grew up listening to Elton John. That's my, my icon that's my musical hero him and bernie top and his songwriter that's why i want to be a songwriter because of those two men and then you got a chance to meet elton john and work with him yeah on a perfect day right he's he, well he lives part-time in atlanta and that's where we're from and we're still based there so um over the years i, I got to know him and then i actually had the courage one time at dinner to, to ask him would he be kind enough to play on a record with us. And he goes, well, if you'll let me sing too. And I was like, done deal. <laughs> that, was, that was easy. You're like, no. So, <laughs> you know, to, to have your musical hero, um, not only to, to know him and understand what a great human being he is. You know, so right. many people think of Elton as the songs, which I should, the songs and the showman, but like what a true human being, what, how he gives back, how he cares. It's, uh, you know, I picked the right hero to have, I think. Oh, yeah. I truly do. Yeah, so. and and, uh, and one of the gr great piano players, uh, great songwriters of all time. Right, w without a doubt. But it's also um, w w sometimes you meet people and they may be different than what you imagine them to yeah. be in, as a person. Uh huh. But Elton's he's he's not what you imagine. He's better. He truly is a caring and giving person, and to me that means a lot. Absolutely. I grew up where you know you didn't hear Velvet Underground. I didn't know what. I couldn't spell Velvet Underground from my schooling, much less know what they sang. You know, you learn it later in life, but, you know, I grew up listening to the 70s, the Zeppelin and the Beatles, um, you know, Bad Company. You know, it was just, it was things like that that was on the radio that influenced me. And I never had a problem saying that. I just wasn't the hipster kid. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Ed Roland, Collective Soul, and this 90s classic. What are your thoughts on this song and your memories from hearing it for the first time? What are your memories of the 90s when 
All of this stuff was taking place. It was kind of the last great swipe of rock and roll, if you know what I mean. Uh, make sure to comment below. Let's have a good discussion. If you like our videos, we invite you to subscribe. Be a part of this community. We love to have you. It's always fun to talk about rock and roll and reminisce. Also, check us out on Patreon and our merch. Uh, both of these things they just help us get more interviews and keep the music alive, and that's the idea. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.